world, two things actually. This world is the management consulting world, and this world is the system integrator world. Okay, I, I see those as quite distinct. Now, most management consultants suck, right? And the reason they suck is they peddle models. They literally Thanks. play to ambiguity and tolerance and sell you the five steps to awesomeness or the patented, you know, seven pillars of blah, blah, whatever. And so they peddle models and they are not building capability. They're just giving you an you know, a teddy bear, right? And and paying and charging you a hell of a lot of money to get a bum on a seat to help you work that through. So I find that this is all about building capability, right? It's building collaborative yes. capability and it's building ambiguity tolerance capability. And only if, and, and down in this area, you've got to have real specialist skills. You know, there's some people I work with that are not in the IT discipline. Uh, one of these days, I'll go through one of those case studies with you. Um, but again, you know, if you're, if, if you consult, so let's just say you're an ambiguity intolerant CIO and you want certainty and you go and ask a management consultancy, will you give me a governance framework to be able to be innovative with this platform? They're going to serve you a giant model. They're going to spend a lot of money implementing that model and they're going to have questionable value at the end of it. And the client will say to you, oh, you know, we've got this last mob, but they charge a lot. We didn't get really any value. But if you actually go, no, what you're actually not, what you're asking for is not the right thing. And you don't actually say it that directly. You sort of, again, you do that a little bit more subtly. Um, yeah, but I, you, I, I think I think saying it that directly is actually fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually more subtle about it. Depends on the collaborative maturity of the organization, you know, um, yeah. but you, uh, you know, usually what I actually, actually, here's if uh, I can tell if I can get away with it based on their value, corporate value statement. And particularly if it's on the wall. So if they have these nice, m nice motherhood statements about we're collaborative and we're a one team and we value our people and we have robust conversations, I will do it. And then if oh, I get, God. if I get hammered for it, I'll be like, well, you know, I mean, I'm just only going by what your strategy says. What else should I go on if I'm, I'm an outsider, you know? You and I in a room, man, is going to be really funny because I have no problem. I, I actually said to a customer, I told them straight up, I said, look, you, you have, you, you, you're trying, you're creating a strategic platform. Like you have a problem, you have problems you don't necessarily know you have. You're not, you're not looking for a partner to do this. You need somebody else that can help you to find strategy. And actually, I feel like saying that to them, I said, well, what is your actual output? Like, what is the output that you're looking for here? Like, what do you want to do? And a lot yep. of the time, they can't answer that question, well, and it's because they don't know. Uh, it, it's hard, man. Well, let me now. Okay, then I'm gonna. I'll. I'll uh, I'm done with PowerPoint, by the way. But I'll. I'll leave you with this. This is a quote from my mentor, and I'm gonna actually show you how we do it real quick, and then I'll see how much time we got. Okay. If you want my one best practice, I will give it to you. The one best practice is very simple. You strive for a shared understanding of the problem. That's like it. That. Right. That's and I like the quote from my mentor Jeff, who taught me what I'm about to show you. He says, the holy grail of effective collaboration is creating shared understanding, which is a precursor to shared commitment. And if you don't have the latter, if you don't have shared commitment, then the project will die. It'll just eventually run out of resources or or intent, you know, or drive. So shared commitment is what gives you the energy to sort of see things through. And you can't have shared commitment without shared understanding. And so that's a fundamentally different way of looking at the world than going, how do we get this in scope? You know, and how do we uh, how do we lock these users down so they don't keep on changing their requirements? But um, just as one last little thing, this tool here, right? In that, yeah. Okay, if you want to see a design thinking tool, imagine the power of this. If I was sitting in front of you and your twelve colleagues or fifteen colleagues, and there was a big fat projector screen in front of me. Imagine if we spoke about this for two hours and I asked this question. So what's, well, let's use a platitude, Chris. What's what's a good platitude? I, I told you improved collaboration cost a million bucks to one organization. Have you got any juicy ones that we can use? Let me think of one. Um, let's, let's pick a, let's, let's, let's pick a, a random one that's like not super difficult. Um, oh, let's, I'll just give you an, I'm, no, I'm going to give you a juicy, nasty one. Okay. Oh God! <laughs> if we had best practice innovation in cloud excellence, how would you, how would things be different? Holy smokes! Jeez! All right. Okay. I, I was here, definitely here not is the generic version of this question. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, it's if we had instead wanky platitude. Yeah. Okay. Holy smokes. 
Okay, now here's what we're doing here, by the way. So let's just say that was, um, this is subtle, but it's true. So just say this was um, uh, AI, right? Okay. And you know my here and there? The way I frame that question is what I've actually done is I'm getting you to focus on this, not this. Okay. So typically what happens if you ask the question wrong, the, in fact, the way the killer workshop or almost kill, I reckon this is a 50% chance of project failure from this one thing at the very start. If you said, well, what do we mean by AI? Let's come up with an agreed definition of this. At this point, you're into models. You're going to do a paint by numbers, very elaborate wordsmith thing. If you go now, forget that. If we had, and it doesn't really matter what, you know, if we had an awesome, an in, you know, innovation based on power platform, how things be yeah. different to now, right? I'm going to take this away. Now, let, let's 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 actually do that. Let's play with this, Chris. So yeah, your your manager is a complete platitude peddler and has told everyone he wants best practice innovation in cloud excellence. Yeah. And so if I was your friendly neighborhood facilitator and you were sitting in the audience now and I said, well, if we had this, how are things be different to now? And what sort of answers would we get, you know? I don't know. I'm just... <laughs> more and more. Make sense? Yeah, I get it, I get it. Um, oh, something like, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know, uh, you know, uh, um, time saving. Uh, there's always, it's, always, it's always time, money, the usual, oh, it is. The usual yeah. stuff. So just imagine, though, this is my universal go-to question, by the way. I'm, I'm giving you all of the, uh, the cool kind of things. So this is, this is I call this the platitude buster question. And <sighs> it pretty much, if you think of the strategy on a page, right? You, have, you know, those sort of single page strategies where you go like mission, vision, focus areas, key result, you know, KPIs and stuff. Okay, yeah. if you put 15 people in a room or 20 people in a room and you do this, right, you're going to get a lot of nodes on the screen. A lot. You it doesn't, you get a lot. And if you get them to start clustering these together into thematic groups, right? And then exactly, you know, when you said, what are the patterns? Yeah. The question I always say, every time someone sits back and says, you know what this is really all about? Yeah. Come up with that. So basically, and I'm doing this like live on screen. This is dialogue mapping. So you're visualizing conversations. Um, but every engagement we've ever done, for the last 10 years has basically started with me using that question format. And then just to get the boundaries and the scope and pick up the intersections, because you know how you never have a clean slate, there's always other projects and programs at work. And, well, then I would say something like um, um, other key aspects we need to be And so that's like the kind of scope. Oh, there's another project. There's this. We're about to change this. You know, um, we've got a, 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 you know, we've got a big restructure happening in this area. You know, all of those sort of things, um, because that surfaces hidden scope bits and pieces. But the thing about these themes, and the thing about, you know, every word says faster, more of, less of, this saved, this gained. Yeah, every single one of those is measurable, right? They're all measurable. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And so it doesn't take much interaction, uh, you know, sort of it, it doesn't take much where I can turn these into single like strategy on a page and go, right, okay, so you want to govern the power platform, you know what's important to you? It's this theme and it's this theme and it's this theme. Don't worry about what COE says. That's what's important to you. No, now, sorry, that's, 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 you map backwards. sorry, what's that? So you get, the, you get the, pro the real problem statements, then you map the tech upwards, not the problem statement downwards. Yeah. That's right. That's right. This is interesting. I've been, you've got to remember, so sitting sitting in Microsoft, I have I have not done what I would deem like a discovery exercise. And I, I couldn't, I don't know if I've mapped this into a discovery exercise, but like I haven't done this type of thing in a year and a half or well, two years now. So yep. I'm wondering if it might be worth doing, you know, they, you know that Microsoft have got that Catalyst uh, program going on. Yeah, I only just heard of it, and I saw this, I could see it was dripping with design thinking, and I was thinking to myself, I got to get in on that because they wouldn't be aware yeah. of any of our previous work uh, in this area. So 
I want to, um, yeah, before you go, uh, you got to find out who's running that because I want to basically say, well, we've been doing this for quite a long time and, and have learned quite a, and got quite a lot of case studies. But, um, but yeah, no, so just basically like, and in fact, check out this one. If I just quickly, this is, this is not IT, but imagine this. If I just quickly go to about here, that's, you see how like, it's a, that, that's kind of what I described. You have your question, you get answers, you start to sort of cluster them, and then yeah. you start to get a bit of emergent sort of stuff. But by the time I was done, actually my objective here was not te technical at all. It was actually oh. to produce a strategy. In fact, check this out, it goes like this. Basically, I produced this for them, right? So the, yeah. the objective for me wasn't to deliver a solution, but the whole point was that then that that strategy was actually used to create business case to do a whole bunch of work. So yeah, this this kind of technique is once you learn these tools, sense making yeah, no. tools, they go because complex problems aren't with exclusively within the domain of IT. Um, and so yeah, like we've ended up doing all sorts of uh, cool ones in, in various different scenarios. Yeah, getting back to you know sort of why <clears throat> we do the things we do ultimately it comes back to we recognize the nature of the problem we're dealing with and we've found tools that assist in the sense making process of which design thinking does a very good job and design thinking is brought into the mainstream which is terrific um, but i would encourage people to not think that design thinking invented any of this stuff. In fact, they didn't. Most of the ideas have actually been around for 50, 60 years, which is the crazy thing. It's taken us that long to finally start to, you know, embrace uh, these sort of tools uh, in, the, in the corporate toolkit. This, this design thinking stuff actually gets me really excited because I hadn't, in, in biz apps, I would never really gone through this process because, you know, there were always like existing issues. So you're constantly solving the existing issue. Um, now with Power Platform, I think it opens up a lot of doors to do this type of stuff. Mm. Actually, that well, that, that um, really, really uh, makes uh, uh, Our most successful Power Platform project, which is pushing the platform to its absolute limits. Um, mm. uh, sometime I'll, uh, I should, that's a different conversation, but it started out with dialogue mapping like this. Um, we then, what, during that session, we did low fidelity prototypes just on whiteboards, right? Yeah. Um, we then took that and used that to create wireframes. But the cool thing we did was imagine, uh, any when you do this in live conversation, someone will come up with an absolute perler of a quote, you know, one of those apps, you know, just they sum it beautifully, right? And I usually capture, you know, um, key summation of what someone said. Yeah. And now, Here's what we then do. We then cut, we go back and find these nodes and imagine a wireframe, right? That tells a story of how an app's gonna behave, but imagine on top of that wireframe overlaid on it are nodes like this, that literally say, this was your intent as we captured it, right? This is a thing based on all, you know, this theme based on all of this really, you know, in fact, it's really like that. Um, imagine now looking at a wireframe just in PowerPoint that shows you the original quote and the intent and we can, we're able to in the wireframe go here is how we're going to realize that intent. We think that we can meet this intent um, of what you've said, that key theme by doing the, it this way and this way and this way. And so, um, that so, is gold. And so that you've is, got that full traceability of requirements, you know, does that make sense? Dude, that is gold. Yes, yeah, and then, that's, that is then really the Power Platform is just so great because you can then quickly knock up screens, you know, yeah. and usually within a workshop, when we come back the second time, we go, here's what you said, here's the wireframe, and by the way, here's one screen. So imagine that sort of transition from, you know, abstract yeah. notes just on maps now. through to now. the story of the app through to, the, through to one screen. Okay, I figured out where the value button is here then. Okay, and I, I think this this... Honestly, this is probably the clearest way I've ever heard anyone put this stuff. Because it's it's you, you talk to people sort of around like their process of I, I don't necessarily think this is requirements gathering. Like in my brain, it makes it makes it's something yeah. different to me in my own head. And I can't maybe I'm not gonna try and verbalize it because I think I need to chew on this for a little bit. But like this right here for me is probably one of the clearest ways I've ever heard this being articulated. It's 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 being able to give them value really quickly, but based on an actual need 
that they potentially didn't know they had. Yeah. And that's, Paul, that is hard, man. Like, that is really, really difficult to do. I think you've probably you've probably cracked the gold mine on this. Uh, well, I said that to Jeff Conklin, who taught me this, and he goes, ha, huh, people have been telling me that for 20 years. Um, so, uh, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, well, for us, it's the secret source on why we've done well, because Power Platform for us is just the logical extension of design thinking. It's a great design thinking tool. Because yeah. the other thing about Power Platform is this, even if it doesn't suit your requirement, right, and you go, this isn't going to work, you've got a functional prototype that you can hand and get done by bespoke developers. So if you just take this kind of logical idea, if here's your conceptual starting point where it's just well-framed questions, and there are more than these ones, people can go to YouTube if they want to, they search for powerful questions. I've done three videos on it. Um, okay. If you start here and start to then synthesize what is really important and turn that into like a single page strategy that articulates what Power Platform is going to do for you, right? Now I can do you a kick-ass governance plan and I can skip the bits from COE that don't matter and I can emphasize the bits that do and I can fill the gaps that aren't there and I can tell you how that bit's you know going to work and give you a whole sort of strategy on, on how it's going to go but even for solutions you know the fact that you can go from map to whiteboard prototype to wireframes and we, we wireframe the crap out of things because it tells the visual story um, and then from wireframes to sample screens with that iterative feedback, if you go back to that PowerPoint deck, this is everything we're doing is harnessing the green line, not the red line. You know what I mean? So, uh, and I think the blind spot for systems integrators is they can't live without the red line because they need to define scope because they keep, get, you know, they keep going and doing fixed price. Yeah. Sorry, what's that? You're solving a targeted problem. It's, yeah, well, it's they're the applying, they're applying tame problem techniques to a complex. Yeah. Uh, the complex domain, which makes zero sense. Spot on, dude, 100% on the money. I I really dig this, man. I, I, honestly, like, all those little bits I think I've picked up in the last year have literally come together with this in my head. And it might be the right time, actually. I was I was waiting for, you know, passion disagreement, you know. Um, I, I, would have, I would have disagreed with you a year ago. I would have disagreed with you. And the reason is because on that gauge, man, okay, you, yep. you, you literally said it right now. I was using tame problems. I was using tame techniques to solve complex problems because for me, think, think about it. Like you come from a world of SaaS, right? So you come from a world of software as a service. You have a tool that solves a, a specific problem. So look at Dynamics. Dynamics' biggest products that it sells are customer service and sales. Yep. Okay. The two biggest products, most Dynamics projects will be those two. It's very, like you will get XRM projects, which is like extended relationship management, which yep. is fine, but you're still building on a layer. So you're yes. always like, and, and, and that's the thing. Do you, yeah. do you remember what I said to you? Like I, I actually felt that was my hypothesis and I tested it on you because I felt that like Dynamics folks, did they, you know, the problems are more structured. The problem domain of what they're solving is less ambiguous, right? But you take CDS and now you start pushing over to here because you're starting to get into the bespoke kind of world where like dynamics, the data model, most of it's done for you. And most most smart yeah. people think around the edges and don't screw with it too much because they they know what upgrade pain and dependency hell feels like. So whereas if you're over here, like that, that turbine app that we built, you know, that I was telling you about, um, that one came, you know, we had to figure that one out for ourselves. You know, we went through a couple of iterations to uh, to get it right. Um, that's kind of, I guess, you know, I, I guess as you go from XRM through to just using, you know, like Dataverse itself, that's that, yeah, point solution to platform transition that you, you talk about. And, uh, and I think this is why SharePoint was so troublesome for many integrators as well, because they just didn't treat it for the domain that existed in. You know, they were way over here using the, the tools that work so well in this kind of world. Um, and then, you know, they'd, they wouldn't learn from it. They'd do the same thing and think that, well, if we do it again, but we'll do it stricter this time, we'll get it right. Or we'll just scope it so badly that you deliver zero value. You know, and then you wonder why the customer's not satisfied, you know. So it's almost like, yeah, they're just literally just trying to smash the green line into a red line and then wondering why, you know, it's just not going to work. So, yeah, no, I reckon um, uh, having having a radar for the type of problem you're dealing with is probably the biggest 
um, blind spot, I, I feel, I don't know if you agree, maybe it's a big call. I think the biggest blind spot in the IT industry as a whole is that they don't appreciate the type of problem they're dealing with, number one. And then the, what goes with that blind spot is most of them are driven by an absolute need to run away from ambiguity. So they will misuse design thinking and use it in a, in a mechanistic kind of paint the numbers kind of way because they're actually using it to get it from, you know, that kind of primal part of the brain to make it feel logical again. You know what, man? I've, I've, like a light bulb has just gone off and you're, you're bang on the money. I, I promise you, Paul, I would not have agreed with you on this stuff a year ago. And I think genuinely I wouldn't have. Like I would have, I would have basically said to you that like structured data models will solve all your problems. Genuinely. That's literally what I, and I think I did say that to you, but now based on, based on, I mean, this is the, this is the great thing about growth, right? Is that you can, as long as you can accept more knowledge, it's, that's what it is. And I'll tell you something interesting. I've got to, I've got to equate this back to Lego because I am a nerd, right? So <laughs> it's just how it is. But like, think about it like this. Okay. So tame, technical, familiar, structured, and actually complex to an extent. You can solve, so think of it as your, your pre-built Lego sets. You get given all the pieces, right? Mm. You get given bags of all the goodies and you can snap them together and you can, you can solve that problem. Or else you can buy the set already glued together and stick bits on top of it and make it a little bit yours, right? Yes. It's start moving that dial over. So like recently, you're going to laugh at this. I built this giant Lego pirate island. It's massive, man, with the kids. And actually, it's really complex. Like there's pieces that come off. There's like little traps and things and treasure chests all over the place. It's really intense, man. But we didn't know what we were building when we started. I could tell you honestly that I had no cooking clue what I was creating. We were just putting yep. blocks on them. But it was fun, right? And we, we made something really cool. And as we grew it, the more pieces we added and the more things we did, actually, the more problems we found, we were like, oh, man, we've got a roof that like got, has got a stick on there. But then there's a mast on the roof and it links to that thing. So we spent a lot of time basically building as we went. But the problem changed. The whole yes. thing changed as we started building. We had no instructions. We followed no instructions, and we were doing the, the green chart yep. literally the whole time. It was this one. Like, you were just literally there. It is the first one. Yeah. 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 No, and that's, again, that's why that's why Conquer called it opportunity-driven problem solving, right? You're mm -hmm. learning by, you know, it, it's literally like, yeah, you've yeah. had an opportunity to see the problem in a different light, right? So you see the problem in a different light, which therefore allows you to suddenly see solutions that you didn't see previously. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, that that's exactly that that problem you describe is is very much the green line. Um, but it's funny how people see the green line as a problem, you know, as a, as an exercise in in locking people down into scope or or uh, you know. And when you look at it through this lens too, consider this. You know, when like I've seen this several times now, someone does a beautiful process diagram. You know, the diamonds, the circles. You know, the BPMN standard type of diagrams. And, and my business partner is awesome at them. I, I'll never be anything like him. But I have seen a project fail because once the solution was delivered, um, there were assumptions that were untested because no one had visually seen the solution at that point. Um, and that's why wireframes are so powerful because I find wireframes more powerful to tell a story and facilitate this green line moving than a process diagram. You know, the logical abstracted view tells you the idealized view of what's going on, but it's only when you start to actually put it in front of people in the user interface, they suddenly go, oh, and as soon as they go, oh, you've seen it's gone like this, bang, bang. And whereas yeah. the process diagram does not give you the same level of opportunities to have that, oh, kind of moment. Yeah, I, f I find that a lot of When I talk to customers, um, in fact, when I was onboarding new partners with Microsoft, a lot of the time I did, I, I mean, slides are cool, and it's good to do them, but I spent a lot of time doing practical demos, so like actually showing them how to build apps. Hell yeah. And um, the response I got actually was really interesting because, you know, I would, I would whack a little Canvas app together and um, show them how to do something cool. So I do this little app build where I can do a whole platform solution in 45 minutes. And um, the response is interesting because with customers, they love it because they're like, oh, it's time to value. Partners are like, but how do I make money from this? And I'm like, mate, if you're just making money from building an app, right? That's where your problem is going to be. I'm like, there's a much yeah. wider world of things out there. And actually, so think about this, right? We get in front of a customer, you and I, we, we stick an app together for them in like an hour. And we say, look, this is how it works. And we wireframe it together, right? So we show them some screens. And they're like, all right, app's done. I'm like, no, 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 my friend. Your solution is far from done. Because think about it like this. Treat it, treat it um, as if 
if I'm adding one field to an app screen, why am I adding it, right? And underneath all of that, there's a lot of things to, you know, try and figure out, right? Will that field be used in reporting? Why will it be used in reporting? Will that field allow for automation, artificial intelligence? Why will that happen? Think about the iPod, right? So like when you build an app, it's really too easy to build an app with 100 fields that do 100 things. It is way more difficult to build an app with five fields that do 100 things. Yes, all that that's the science, baby. Yeah, that's it, man. So simplicity is complexity underneath the hood. And you're paying for simplicity yep. by allowing us to build the complexity or, or solve the complexity. And that's the thing. I always say to the partners, I'm like, you building the app is not is maybe one fiftieth of the problem, right? You're solving a piece of it. There's a lot more in there where you make your money. And for customers, fine, go ahead and build the apps, but then you still need the partner base to build out those layers underneath it. And that goes exactly right back to this diagram. It's perfect. Well, I would tell so with the partners thing. Um, yeah. the, the point where I'll like, you know, I, I am not going to go and tell partners how they should solve that problem because like that's for them to figure out if, if they can't get past this side, then, you know, then, okay, sucks to be them. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, no, you are exactly right. Just the fact that that question, oh, how do we make money, you know, is the paradigm. Yeah, they, they don't understand the paradigm that they're operating in. I am like, yeah, you, you are so over here. That there's a whole world that you are completely oblivious to and oh, but yeah. it's hard now because you know the boutique companies know how to do it because they've seen it they have that nimbleness but it's hard for the large ones because they sort of you know the model works and at a certain scale you don't want to change that model because what works keeps everyone fed so i get it but i think at the moment the low, low code is a massive paradigm change and it's still unfolding um but i think microsoft are doing the right things with the design thinking the thing I would warn them, um, and if any watch this, I would warn them that don't be very careful not to paint it as the one model to rule them all. And just, I don't want it to become another one of these. That can't no. become another model where dumb shit is done in its name, all because someone's running away from staying in that gray area where they feel dissonance, they're uncertain, because that's where innovation comes from. And that's where a lot of deep learnings come from. So if you kind of just run away and retreat to one of these and, you know, seek out safety in the structure of filling in the paint by numbers um, of these things, then um, that's the danger. So I, I fear that well-meaning consultancies will go, I will take the Microsoft one because it has, it's been legitimized now because it's from Microsoft. Okay, tick, FOMO, or well, that's the, you know, if Gartner yeah. says it or Microsoft says it, there's, you know, some CI ambiguity of those CIOs go, cool, there's my Teddy, leg legitimization. Then the next thing is, right, the best practice is to do this and then this and then this and then this and that's the slight danger in what i when i looked at that material it is a little bit prescriptive um, although it still comes from all the right places i mean um yeah, yeah. design design thinking recognizes wicked problems it actually is it's rooted in dealing with wicked problems if you if you do design thinking courses they'll talk about them they romanticize them a little bit from the original intent but nevertheless it's still packaged up in such a way that it's almost so seductive it just becomes yet another model that people apply in a very unthinking way and it becomes their teddy bear. Make sense? Spot on. And actually, I think, I think if we summarize this, like the one thing I'm taking away from it is that acceptance of ambiguity is fine, but it's what you do with it which counts. And if you're trying to hammer ambiguity into like a formalized problem, you're probably going to struggle and vice versa. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I would I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. I like I like the idea of ripping away somebody's teddy bear, man. I'm actually gonna start saying that to people. <laughs> Give me it's, your teddy it's bear. The art of, it's the art of teddy bear handout and teddy bear substitution. I find you don't see if you yeah, if you rip them, you will just get this. Yeah. yeah. Kid, right? That's what it's important. But if you can kind of like frame a, like if like uh, I'm actually I'm, I'm gonna have fun at academics expense, right? If I go in, particularly management science, if I go and do something at a university, particularly an MBA, they are super into management models and complexity theory and all of this sort of stuff. And like literally, I know exactly what to say to a lecturer in an MBA to legitimize everything I'm about to do, just because yeah. I know their terminology, I know the models, I know what they teach, I know what's familiar to them. So yeah. in effect, what I'm doing is I'm going, here you go, I'm handing you your Teddy. I'll talk about it in a certain way that seems familiar, but then I'll go and sort of, I'll still ask my, the questions that I want to ask, you know, I'll elicit what I need to elicit. But 
So yeah, um, I reckon the art is learning how to take someone who's got a teddy bear like that and substitute it with another one, or, or just bring them along that spectrum, you know. And yeah. and uh, um, actually, funny enough, I will end on this. I will end on this. This is actually from the, the class because you, you, this is all to do with um, framing. All right, framing workshop design. And okay, see this. Right? How do yeah. we approach workshops? Hand out teddies if you need to reduce upfront anxiety resistance. Uh, Pro supporting yeah. argument, probably the biggest impact on setting initial conditions for collaborative work. And so here's a couple of example teddies for you, all right? These are all true, every single one of these. Now I'm only going to show you a couple of them. That there in Australia is a document that was written um, in the mid 2000s about the complete uh, dealing with wicked problems in agencies, public sector agencies. Um, uh -huh. If I am dealing with the public sector, I will print this document out and I will have it a few copies around because I put this up. I am basically handing them out the legitimizer teddy bear because this is the federal government and all of the state governments, if the feds have said, hey, this is the way to go, everything I do from then on is completely legitimized. You know what I mean? So that's an example of a teddy bear handout, the way I might sort of frame a uh, uh, a problem. And like if a company is like super, super conservative and do strategy, I'll usually pull up like a strategic plan. Like doesn't really matter which one. And I'll say, look, you know, I mean, we all know we start with vision, objectives and activities, but actually I, I feel that we should work start in the middle. Actually just as innovative companies that I've worked with that have, have found uh, an effective way to start in the middle. Are you all comfortable with that? Oh yeah, cool. Like that's me symbolically handing them their you know, uh, strategic, strategy, so, teddy bear. strategy teddy bear. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of the uh, the art of, um, yeah, the art of uh, running good workshop is actually not necessarily ripping them out, but knowing how to almost tip your hat to them so that you re the resistance fades away because whatever you, whatever you're about to say fits in, you know, the sort of realm of, uh, of, of what's acceptable. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. I love it, man. I absolutely, absolutely love it. Love it. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's kind yeah. of, there you go. I should leave it on that because that's the IT industry, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's awesome. I've learned a lot, man. Thank you. Uh, look, hey, thank you. We've been at it for a while. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I didn't know how long it was going to take, actually. And I'll, I, to be frank, I was expecting you to uh, to challenge uh, various bits more and, you know, pick holes and all of that sort of stuff. You've mellowed out, mate. I have. Not yet, though. <laughs> not yet. I still, I, still have, I still have some decisions to make on other things. But, no, I agree with you. Like I said, a year ago, I would have, I would have disagreed purely because of the fact that I, I – I think that I was using one hammer to solve all the problems, but um, yeah, no, no, I'm not. Like I've 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 made, I've made a conscious effort to learn a few things outside of like discussions I've had with you and a few others, purely because I needed to make sure that I was educated if I was going to be arguing the point validly. Yep. And um, now I can, thanks to cool. you and a number of us. so yeah, man, thank you. And I think I, I love that dial. I love the I love the problem dial. Like that to me. It speaks to exactly what we, we were saying before, that, that gradient chart that they have the platform, it's just a lot more pointed. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be using descriptions like that. And I love your I love your mix between like the management consultants and the SI piece. I think that that is so true. And coming from talking to like all these different partners over the last year and a half, that's exactly what I'm seeing. Okay. It's literally yeah. exactly what I'm seeing. Going back to the measure twice cut once thing. I'm like, that's that's all well and good if the second time you measure, shit hasn't changed. Right? Yeah, but if, it's, if it is a complex problem, and you can't. My response is that, again, the measure twice, cut once paradigm, guess what side that is? Oh, that's definitely going to be same technical familiar structured. Damn straight. Every time. Every Damn time. Straight. And, and, and in fact, the text, I completely agree. But if I'm dealing with one where I know the understanding of the problem's evolving, then you measure once and then you measure again, it's different and you can't predict the difference and you measure it a third time, it'll be different from the last two. That's the essence of, uh, if, if that was not a truism, then you'd be on the left side. And you have to be okay with ambiguity. And I think before I wasn't, I was constantly, constantly sort of frontal cortex, like that's where I lived. Now, I'm actually super cool with ambiguity, man. I mean, 
quite honestly, I'm happy to walk into a problem that I know is going to be constantly changing and not freak out. But I'll tell you why. Because I've opened my mind from a technical sphere perspective and I'm working in Power Platform. I'm not living in Dynamics. I love Dynamics. It's yeah, great I think tool. Power Platform's great. It's really stress testing this, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's a great tool set to snap into this, this type of process because I think you can solve most types of problems with it. And that's what I love about it. You can solve most types of problems. And what's yep. great about it is that because it's low code, you can handle a moving target. Well, this is the, that's the essence, you know, and that's why, you know, getting back to our continued discussions, why we called it data, beer and devil horns, the data part was actually really, now that I've put this up, all right, canvas apps are really good here to prototype. And eventually, over time, those canvas apps will become more complex and start to have complexity and integrate with other things. And obviously, it will, it will over time, take on characteristics of a very complex data model type of project, like a you know an XRM kind of one, where that's your starting point. Um, so and and to the, you know that that's my remaining question. You know the emergent data modeling over time as you lock in, um, and yet you you know um, just that tension between avoiding dependency hell yet not being driven by a data model if it's the wrong one. You know based on an improved understanding of a problem or an app that started out, you know, the app, a little innovation done by one team suddenly is for whole of organization and because that happens, right? And then that whole rethinking. So anyway, you know, that that's the, that, that will be further mysteries to discuss, but, you know, maybe subsequent videos, we can kind of use this as a bit of a gauge, you know, for. Yeah, I'd like to, the, the one thing I want to, I want to, maybe in the next one, man, we can chat about like the, the process around sort of, well, number one, how to snap the technology into the problem. I think that that would be a really good chat. Yeah. Especially, especially around the emerging data model type stuff, because I think that that's not a lot of people get it, but it's going to be a question on people's lips. And I think actually to be, to be honest and also to be fair on Microsoft, I think at the time where they wanted to unify the worlds of the model driven and the canvas, which mm -hmm. is a noble intent and makes a lot of intrinsic sense. I think Microsoft themselves probably didn't appreciate the, different problem characteristics of those two worlds. And so hence why having under, an understanding of, you know, this kind of spectrum is is very handy for knowing, um, you know, when to pivot from one to the other or where to start and where to end. Totally, totally. Oh man, I, I love this. Well, I'm going to use this, hope you don't mind. Uh, it's fine. Uh, now you're just going to plug the book. That's the only thing I don't have in here. Oh, this all comes yeah. from the second book. Oh, hang on, no, yeah, I do. Oh, this is getting shameless now. Where is it? There it is, that one. Yeah, no worries. That's all about ambiguity, teddy bears, and, you know, that's where that model comes from. So you just you just have to uh, give a shameless plug for that, and you can use and abuse that diagram as you wish. I shall. I shall shamelessly plug it. Don't you worry. <laughs> no worries at all. Awesome, man. Well, listen, it's been epic to chat. Um, I'm going to go and do kitty stuff now. But yeah, I, I love this. I really do, man. This has been educational. Thank you, as usual. Uh, no, thank you. And also, um, yeah, we'll get back into case studies, various other bits and pieces, I'm sure. But um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, if, if people on YouTube have stuck around for two hours on this one, then yeah, I have to say thank you to them as well. Um, but yeah, who knows? We'll see if, oops, see what the response is to this kind of, all this hippie, bloody, wicked problem stuff that I'm you know, I like it. besotted by. <laughs> I dig it, man.